All right, well, welcome everybody to today's ISFSI Modern Mentor Presentation, Data-Driven Training Programs. We're joined today by Dr. Lori Moore Morell from International Public Safety Data Institute. The discussion today will explore why fire service leaders need to use performance measures to drive operational and policy decisions, support fiscal requests and advice training curriculum. We will also explore how to use live data and performance measures at the company level to empower officers and firefighters to improve performance and reduce risk using the National Fire Operations Reporting System. A little bit about our presenter today. Dr. Lori Moore Morell is the President and CEO of the International Public Safety Data Institute. Her role with IPSDI began in 2019 after serving 26 years as a senior executive for the International Association of Firefighters. Lori is an international speaker, presenter, and author, and has received numerous distinguished awards. Her career has included serving in a leadership capacity on multiple board of directors, commissions, and councils. One of her biggest projects while with while with the IAFF was leading a research team that included international fire service organizations and other partners to produce landmark re reports and other tools that have changed the face of fire and EMS deployment around the world. Thank you, Lori, for joining us today. The stage is now yours. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you very much uh, for having me this afternoon. And good afternoon to everyone who is on the webinar. I'm excited to get to spend some time with you today and just to go over some of the opportunities to use data as you begin training curriculum preparation, uh, thinking about how to be much more specific about training within your own department. As Jamie said, don't hesitate to jot down a question as we go through. We'll try to save some time at the end to have some interaction uh, and spend some time answering your questions. So today uh, we are going to talk about data. Uh, as Jamie said, I am with the International Public Safety Data Institute. This is a brand new institute, uh, just formed this year. We are a uh, nonprofit um, stood up by a collaboration of fire service organizations. One of the things that we're going to focus on today is really leveraging technology uh, to provide life-saving insights. And that really is the mission of the new Data Institute. Uh, this is why we were formed to be able to provide technology back to the fire service, far beyond what you are experiencing today with your RMS system or any other data, um, data set that is um, virtually unusable in many regards at the local level. And so what we wanted to do is build um, tools by the fire service for the fire service, and that's what makes um, our research efforts and our data efforts a bit different. As I said to you, the mission, of the new Data Institute is to enhance public safety through data science. So how can we better put your data in context so that it's not just entering information, that it actually means something and it's usable to you? Uh, we also do conduct a lot of research, and I will mention uh, our most recent research, uh, our ongoing project, just before we conclude today. Uh, we do provide training in the area of data as well and data science to our departments and the users of the tools that we have developed. The vision, of course, um, that goes along with that is to give you something that's actionable, something that is not just looking at numbers or reporting output, but to really leverage the information in your data and make it actionable within the department. Today, obviously, we're going to focus on training. So these are the partners uh, for the Institute. As I said to you, we are a collaboration of fire service organizations. Many of these uh, you recognize. We are funded um, almost exclusively by the assistance of firefighters grants through FEMA or Homeland Security. We do have some other projects going on with CDC and NIOSH um, in those arenas, and we'll talk just a little bit about that today before we conclude. But our other partners you can see, we are basically the, the same team um, that did the NIST reports that you might remember, the residential and the high-rise NIST reports, same partnership. Uh, so we actually have been together as a group for about 15 years. So we're not new to the work that we're doing. Uh, it's simply a new institute. We moved all of our research under the new Public Safety Data Institute, <clears throat> and then we reside now there. 
um, as do our data tools. Everything that we do as an institute uh, really does revive a, a, a revolve around fire department core values. And so I always like to start any discussion with this slide because it really gives you the premise uh, by which we operate. So everything from obviously protecting lives, property, and the environment through our core values of preparedness, prevention, public education, and emergency response. And certainly training falls in that preparedness um, corridor. It is important, it's vital actually, to being able to do the other um, actions within that core value list. So always with an emphasis on quality, efficiency, effectiveness, and safety for our firefighters. So given that, then where we would like to start as far as talking about data today is just to emphasize that we need to tell a more complete story. Now that can be in the operations arena, that can be within the prevention arena, education, and certainly within the fire service training arena. So how do we tell a better story? How do we find out where the needs are rather than doing the way things the way we've always done it? And that's typically the way we operate in the fire service. So doing it though, you know, the way we've always done it, we can't really change because we've always done it that way. But data can give us some insight so that it does show you a pathway for change. It shows you the need, obviously, for change. And so that you have the uh, information you need to plan as you go forward in many arenas. And so this is an important aspect. And if you reference or hear somebody reference telling your story, this is really what it is talking about. So regardless of the category or the framework or your, um, your frame of mind, it really does help to have data to enhance your story. So let's talk about data in the training arena uh, just a little bit. So a lot of departments, and I'm sure all of yours, work very hard to stay in the forefront of in firefighting, emergency medical techniques, technology, and training becomes vital. It is why you exist, it's why the organization um, that you represent today exists, because we know that training is a part of everyday activity. So what is in the operational data? And that's what I'm gonna share with you today. What can we find in the operational data of your department that provides you information on which to train? And that's where we're going to be looking at the data today. So in order to do that, I am gonna be showing you the Enforce system. This is the National Fire Operations Reporting System. This is a comprehensive data set that is actually pulled straight in from CAD uh, or from your RMS system. It is connected so that there is no additional firefighter data entry burden. What we do is leverage either the efforts that you've already made or we're gonna pull using a data exchange pathway straight off your CAD in order to get these data, carry it through some pretty powerful analytics and be able to give you some insights um, into not only operations, but how can we use that operational data to show us where to train and whom to train. And so that's where I wanna start with you today. So to do that, I am gonna switch out of the slides, so bear with me for just a moment. We're gonna switch over to um, Live Enforce Dashboard. So there we go. First of all, I'm gonna uh, just show you the website. You will be able to go to our website and I'll give you all of the addresses at the end of the presentation. As I mentioned to you, Enforce is one of our projects. Uh, we have a couple of different projects ongoing but you can read lots more about what we're doing today. I'm gonna to show you one department and how we can leverage the insights again for training, but for more information, you'll be able to visit our websites as well. So let me take you now <clears throat> to Richmond, Virginia. Richmond, Virginia has been connected uh, with the N4. They're one of our original departments. Uh, we have many departments that have come on board uh, since this tool was developed. So what I'm showing you now is Richmond, Virginia's, what we call their control center. So looking at operational data and where we begin to glean some insights, we can see um, today, obviously, uh, the weather, we know what shift is working. We've got a recap of some of the incidents from yesterday. But to get more of our insights, we're gonna go ahead and go over to one of their operational dashboards. And as we pull up the dashboard, uh, we'll be able to see uh, a list of several dashboards. So 
any given department can have a list of multiple dashboards that they can build. They can have everything from you know, water on fire times. They can look at their AVL testing. Uh, we can do data parsing by or categorization by battalion. And I'll be showing you some of this as we go through. So it's important that you remember as we go through this that we're making an effort here to make the data usable, right? So we want to make sure that we have the insights. So the data's got to be in a framework that can be uh, manipulated, it can be moved, it can be filtered, and that's exactly what the Infor's um, system does for you. So just to be able to show you, first of all, that we can see operationally, um, and we've got the last five years of data up here. So let me just filter out. I'm gonna go ahead and filter. I can show you that we could even pull up the last four hours if we wanted to and see what was happening in the city of Richmond, Virginia. So in the nine, they made nine calls in the last four hours. We'll go back just uh, for the demonstration. I'm gonna pull up the last two years of data and we'll see that it's geocoded as you're already getting the, the feel for it here. The calls are geocoded. You can see where the concentrations are within the uh, arena. Uh, you can see where the higher volumes are by the darker spot. We also get into some heads up displays here that start to give us some insights. Now, I'm going to orient you first to the dashboard, and then it's the filtering of the dashboard that's going to matter to you most, because that's really where we get into um, the insights for training purposes. So, We'll see some of their heads up display here, everything from their incident count to the event duration. Um, we'll filter and you'll see a lot of these numbers change in just a moment. How far they travel on each uh, event. So this is their AVL data. Everything that we measure is in the 90th percentile. So this is their response count, which is a very different number uh, than their incident number, right? So 75,000. This is actually how many units they sent to deal with those 75,000 calls that came in. So this is the number of units that actually responded. Their turnout time, 90% of the time. Response time, again, this is um, something that is uh, a combination of their call intake processing and travel time. So this is a total response time. And then we get into some things like water on fire time, so this gets you that insight into operations when they show up. How quickly are they getting water on fire? This is a total time from call intake to processing, turnout, travel, and water on fire. So it's just over a minute that they're able to get water on the fire after arrival on a fire ground. Establishing command, which is the arrival of the battalion chief. Primary search complete. So these are operational indicators that help us know basically the value of what they do when they show up. So why does that matter then to training? So let's begin to filter a little bit. Um, we're gonna scroll on down the page here and I'll show you some of the other, I often call these widgets, but visualization uh, within the data that we can start to parse out and get insights now for training. Because what we do is we take the data and we're able to parse it out by individual units. So if you're bringing units in, uh, for ongoing continued education or drills, then you would know exactly what unit, uh, what these units have been exposed to. And I'll show you in a moment how we can actually filter not just by unit, but by shift. So you know exactly what each person has done in their response cadre. So we'll know what they uh, are missing, for example, so we could train on those aspects, or we know what they are actually responding to, and maybe we shore that up as well. So different insights. So here I can show you engine five. This is their EMS call volume. We can scroll on up and see their fire alarm, accidents, structure fires, utilities, on and on, with all of the different types of responses that they've made. Now, if we want to know more about any one of engine five's categorical responses, instead of just scrolling across it, like on structure fire, I'm gonna go ahead and click on that. We'll go up and apply the filter the first time, and then after that, it'll become automatic. So we'll just filter out engine five fires, and there they are. So we can see where they are, but more importantly, let's have a look 
at their uh, performance and how they did on these fires, right? So there's your event duration. You can see that's very different than the department overall, which was like 31 minutes. This department does not do EMS transport, so they do have a much shorter overall um, on-scene time, but for fires, much longer, obviously. How long it took them to travel there, their turnout time, their response time is much better than the department overall, water on fire time, also um, a, a command established and primary search complete. So we can actually see engine five, and this is all shifts of engine five, we could filter further and get just A shift, B shift, engine five. So I can see exactly the types of calls um, that they've been able to, uh, to respond to. So this is just their fires. We could have done all calls for engine five and we would have been able to get better insights into their performance on all of their calls. So we'll just switch back and continue on uh, with the dashboard. Show you a couple of other ways that we can filter the data to be able to get these insights. So we can do that, um, that filtering for any unit. So just like we did for engine five, I can see the types of calls. We can bring them up individually for any unit um, here. And we'll get some trend analysis on these units in just a moment. So again, having that kind of information about what has that unit responded to? What have they seen? What are they doing regularly in that, um, that particular arena or in their first do? Then we can look at the department overall. We can see if you wanted not to parse out by units, but just look at the department overall, we can see another widget that gives us information on just their EMS. So this is a 67% EMS um, response department. This is their accident, right, fire alarm. So you can begin to get insights, you know, what type of calls are you making? So we know what to better train on, or what are you missing that we need to shore up? Again, those would be the insights operationally that we can see just exactly what they're responding to as a department. A couple of other things that I'll show you uh, as we go forward, this is um, by first due. So for example, this is uh, station 11 first due area. So I can click on this and we'll be able to see exactly the type of calls that happen in their first due area. So we'll just filter the dashboard by station 11 and you'll see the dashboard filters now let's go back up and we can see obviously engine 11 is the busiest unit running from that station but this is their call volume so they are very different in that station than the department overall the department overall is about 66 percent if you recall 67 percent ems this first two area is almost 80 percent ems so they still also see a lot of accidents fire alarms, structure fire, so we can see. But the question is, what do we do differently in training? Because I know this station is seeing plenty of EMS. What type of EMS calls are they? So we could even filter further to be able to see, do I need to shore up or train differently? Because I have this insight on this particular station. So this helps us to see what, they, what you anticipate them responding to and an effort then to make sure that they are adequately trained to handle those types of responses. So again, people being moved around, perhaps a new uh, people being deployed to this station uh, may train a bit differently than other stations. So we could do that kind of analysis on every single department, or excuse me, every single station uh, within the department and be able to see exactly what they're seeing in their first two areas so that you can target better uh, with your ongoing drills, um, your ongoing continuing education. So even into um, their first due arena, this is their response time, but we can also look at their mutual aid. So this is a mutual aid bar. I have a mutual aid bar here, so it's not their highest volume, obviously, but we could see even if I wanted to filter here, what are they responding to from a mutual aid standpoint so that we can shore up and make sure that the training matches the actual response type. So a couple of other things that we can see just from the data. Um, this is information that's a, a geographic breakdown. So looking at um, geographic response zones. So if you wanted to just look at the, uh, the community itself, um, if we were talking about perhaps public education versus training um, with the firefighters or medics themselves, 
then I could parse the data out here by response zones, and it will tell me the type of calls that are happening in these little neighborhoods. So, for example, we'll just click on uh, this first response zone here, and we'll be able to go up and have a look at what is happening, what type of calls um, are, is this neighborhood seeing? So again, majority of EMS here in this neighborhood. I'll take you all the way up to the map so you can see. It's a little bitty cluster of a, an area there. So we can get to a much smaller geographic bite even than our first due areas, right? So we can even see much smaller um, geographic bites and what kind of responses we're making there. So from, an, uh, again, a public education standpoint, if um, you are involved in any of that, then we would be able to see, even by neighborhood, uh, what kind of um, types of calls we're responding to there. So parsing out the data and having that kind of insight um, into the information itself. So we'll just take the board back. And I could do that you know, for virtually any of these little response zones. These are more like little box alarms or neighborhoods um, that you would be able to, uh, to see. Some of the other information that we capture, um, and we look at call volume by week, but we enhance that information with other things like weather, for example. We're gonna bring in census, we bring in weather information, uh, we bring in city council districts, things like that, your battalions, your shifts, so that you can filter your data by virtually anything. So I can see, this is a call volume by week, so I could even see uh, maybe you have in your department, there are weather events that cause surges in the system. And that's what happens here in Richmond, Virginia. You can see they're relatively consistent. We've got a bit of a surge on this day, and then everything's consistent again. So on these surges, if you do have these type of weather events, regardless of what it is, you'd be able to see it in your data. For example, on this one, I want to show you before we click on that, I want to show you what's happening here with the weather. So we always are going to enhance data with your temperature, your wind speeds, and your precipitation. So it's going to get the ice. It's going to get the wind speeds or wind events. And we'll be able to see that compared to your surges. And so preparing your department to respond under those circumstances, uh, whether it is to prevent slips, trips, and falls, whether it is you know, operations on ice, uh, whatever it might be, so we can see what the, the data tells us about weather events. So for example, this is average temperature, we can see we're at nearly 50, and then the temperature drops and it's sustained for a few days. It goes all the way down um, below freezing, sustains there for a few days, and then it comes back up and we actually get up to 50 again. And that's when this surge happens so that we can see the patterns. Now this could have been an ice event, it could have been um, any sorts of things that would have caused the surge, including flooding, for example. Uh, we've had many flooding events that you can see the surge, so preparing your, your responders for that. But for this particular week with that freeze and then thaw, look at what happened. We had EMS actually dropped, but we had a lot of fire alarms, commercial fire alarms, and a lot of utility incidents. Now, these are things that, you know, not monumental events like it would have been if it had been a wind-driven, or a flood-driven event with a lot of rescues. But you get the idea of how the weather affects and your, your operations and how you as instructors need to prepare for those types of surges. And so that you can see and make sure that those that are responding are prepared as well. So given that, you would be able to have those sorts of insights in your data um, to be able to train according to weather events. So some of the other filters that I will show you here uh, we talked about filtering by battalion. So just like I have done on some of the other uh, filters, we could click on any battalion here and you would have a battalion driven dashboard. So if we just wanted to look at battalion three, for example, we click on battalion three, the dashboard will update for us. I like to go back up and see uh, just in the, the donuts. So we just have battalion three units. Uh, we can see what they've responded to in this particular battalion. Is it their busiest battalion? And we could even filter further, right, to any types of these, any of these units. So you can continue to filter down and get these insights, but you can also save these dashboards so that you have multiple. You could have a training dashboard for each battalion, for example, um, so that you could be able to get those insights. Here's your shift 
um, filter. So we can, as I showed you earlier, I could have selected engine five C shift and know exactly what type of calls they've responded to, uh, where we need to shore, shore them up, uh, where we need to give them insights on types of calls they are not seeing regularly uh, to make sure that they are still maintaining that all hazards capability. Some of the other filters that Richmond uh, also has selected into their dashboard, this is city council, so it's just something interesting for you. Uh, we can parse the data out by city council district. We can also look at the data by frequent, um, frequent flyers, uh, perhaps more diplomatic, your high utilizers, right? So we can see exactly what is happening when we've got these particular addresses. So this is more operational insight than it would be, I guess, for training, but um, seeing when you're responding to an, a, you know, a particular address 400 times in two years, we probably ought to check out what's happening there, right? And so that's a, a bit more operational insight. The last thing that I'll show you um, as far as a, a visualization here is that we can see by time of day, day of week. So we could even look at the data and see um, days of week across the bottom. We have your insights by hour. So looking at where are these peak times, again, this may be a more operational insight um, than training, but you should be able to see um, where you've got peak load volume, so maybe even scheduling training, right, becomes something of a, an event because of operations being so busy. So maybe you have to look at and design different ideas for training, getting units assigned to training, and this data may be helpful to you because I could click on any one of these bars and it would give me the insights of who responded during that hour, where, they're, um, where the calls were, call volume, what types of calls they are, so I can filter the dashboard for any given time. So this might be very helpful to you, uh, again, in scheduling uh, training within your department, being able to see the data and the peak load hours uh, for each unit. So one of the other things that we can do, I'll just scroll back up to the top um, before we leave, is that we can also search for keywords. So for example, uh, most departments are struggling with opioids. And so if you're training, for example, on Narcan deployment, okay, so for EMS, if we're going to distribute Narcan, then I could search for overdose. Now, it doesn't mean all of these are opioid overdoses, but it does show me that Richmond's had 1,500 overdoses in the last two years, and it shows me where they are. So I've got 46 just at this long and lat, or there's two there, sorry, 44 at that long and lat right there. I've got 47 there, 32 there. Overdoses. So these are pretty significant indicators. If these are happening at the same address, probably some opioid involvement. So if you're training on Narcan and we needed to know where to start, if you're just deploying it, you're not doing it full department, you're going to be uh, pilot testing or rolling out some new effort, then this is how you would get those insights. Which units need to go first in order to get that training and get it deployed, right? The operational data tells us that. It tells us who needs to have that, that capability for deployment and that training. So you could do that with all sorts of things. We could search for um, all kinds of EMS indicators from shootings to, um, you know, type of uh, events. We could do car fires. So anything that you wanted to train on, you could even get insights into who's making those calls, where are they most occurring, who needs to go first for any kind of new training, deployment, um, things like that. So that's um, some insights. So I want to go over now. I'm going to go back to the control center. And I'll show you some insights um, also that you can pull for um, after action reports, for example, or doing training uh, based on an after action report. So let's just go into the incident analysis. And these incident analysis are going to give us some insights as well. So I'm just going to see if we can find a fire um, in their data today. So there's a fire alarm. Let's just see if we don't find it. There's a structure fire. Okay. So let's just have a look at this incident. And as you can see, that incident data, and again, there's no firefighter data entry here. So this information is going to, uh, to come straight off your CAD, or we will pull it from RMS or supplement with RMS, right? So Often things are dispatched and then it turns out to be something else. 
we're going to make sure that that update is done within the system. But you're going to have a report. So say this was an after action report um, on this particular fire. Now, it doesn't look like we had any uh, fatalities reported, but had there been or had there been an event, maybe this was a weather-driven event, wind-driven fire, something unique about this event that you would be, as an instructor, be able to go in, pull up all this information, see exactly what occurred, and then be able to address this in training, whether it went well or it didn't go well, right? You'd be able to see these insights. So one of the things that we're going to do is give you all of the incident summary. You'll be able to see a performance uh, of all of the units responding. So every call has a, uh, a benchmark or these, these performance analytics, I often call it a report card, uh, that the department gets to set up on certain benchmarks that they want to hit. Like, was the first due unit the actual first due unit? Or were we sending a, a second due unit as first due because, um, you know, from further away because the first due unit wasn't available? Things like that, um, alarm answering, processing, first engine arrival, you can see some of these metrics. But the department can customize, so you could customize and make other metrics there as well. We're also going to give you insights into the structure, where it was, uh, the geocoding type of um, unit it was, single family, all of your census data is going to be brought in as well, and the weather, of course, will be supplemented. So this was a, a nice, uh, clear morning, it looks like. But it could have been, again, storm, wind-driven, so all kinds of things could have been influencing their performance. We'll be able to see then what each unit was doing on scene, how long they were there. And just like the other dashboard, I'm able to scroll across and see turnout, travel, intervention time. So we can see what each unit was doing uh, during their deployment. We can also get further insight into all of those metrics in that um, dashboard or in that report card. So being able to see the durations, the travel distances, all of these are interactive as well. So I can scroll across them. It's going to give me expected and actual um, outcomes on each of them. And then this is one of my favorite features because often we neglect to, to really talk about uh, what else was going on. So at the time of this structure fire, they had eight other incidents in progress, two of them in the same battalion. So when we look at these kinds of surges, again, in operation, we often need to talk about that in training because what if that first due unit had not been first due, right? So what is happening, and I know you all train on this often, but um, we have to talk to decision makers a lot, so I always bring it up, about what is happening in fire growth, what is happening in fire spread before your arrival, when you are arriving later than a first due unit. That window of opportunity for engagement often moves, right? And so in training, we want to remind them of that and the risk escalation that continues until intervention takes place. And so we would be able to get these insights again from the data. One of the new things that we have recently added, again, that should help, be helpful to you uh, in training is this unit trend analysis. And so each unit, uh, we're going to give you exactly what they've been doing. So I can look at the last shift on engine five. I'd be able to pull up even the last quarter, the last year. We can look at all of their call types. From an operations perspective, I always point out the busyness or whether it was typical because it's a trend analysis. But for training, again, what type of calls are they making? They're pretty active both in fire and EMS. Uh, what kind of uh, uh, performance are they getting, right? Travel time, turnout, things like that that we can always do uh, reminders on remembering the standards and performance and things like that. You can also go here and pull up just their incidents so you can have access to just the incidents they've been involved in. So insights like that, that would just be background for you in doing drills with this particular um, unit, right? So given that, uh, I'm gonna take us back over to the control center and we'll go actually back to the slides now. <clears throat> and I'm gonna pick up and just tell you a little bit more uh, about the system and give you some in other insights for training purposes. So um, what we've been talking about with Infors, and uh, we also are going to send you emails with shift summaries. So if that would be helpful to you, these are customizable. Um, these are the kinds of things that, again, from the data, you would know exactly what is happening in the department overall, 
whether it's trends, uh, fire incidents, what their response times look like, things like that, um, that you can address in training. We, um, in these summary emails, you can look at and customize, again, uh, whether it's turnout time, um, their utilization, overall utilization times, all sorts of things um, that they may be facing in operations that you want to better help them deal with in training. So as we um, move on just a bit, I wanted to talk with you guys a little bit about um, generational differences in training. And I do that because data is important, and that's why we're talking about it in training, but it's going to become more and more important as the generations change within the fire service. There's a new generation that is just now, they're all turning 24 years old, so a lot of them are already being hired by our department, and we're going to have to train them differently than we have in past generations, and that's why the data even becomes more important in dealing with um, these folks. So, historically and even today, we have about three generations, now a fourth, uh, in the fire service, and you've trained these people, and many of you may be boomers, uh, you know you love to show up, you love to work, you like your workaholics, you like the social interaction. And so lectures, interactive discussion uh, has always worked well for you as well as practically. Xers, Gen Xers are the same, um, but they like a good, you know, work-life balance. They're not the workaholics or the boomers, but you're going to train them virtually the same way. The millennials have been a little bit different and a bit of a challenge for the fire service because they are multitaskers. The lecture doesn't work as well for them. They do it, but they would rather be having the experience. And so as instructors, I'm sure that you um, pretty uh, much up your game, really, in training the millennials, um, keeping them goal-oriented. I suspect you've also experienced some attention to detail issues or retention. Um, they don't need to learn their map books because they can, you know, look it up on Google Maps, right? So these are the kinds of things that we have to understand about the generation. Well, the next one is even going to be more uh, different than the millennials. So in just less than six years, we're going to see that 75% of our workforce is going to be millennials. And the question is, who are they going to be leading? And that's this new generation Z. Now, these folks have been born into crisis. They are very much servants, and I should say to you right off the bat, they are very, very different than the millennials. This group are ready to serve. They're ready to work. They're ready to be committed. So they're not going to just up and leave the job to go have an experience somewhere, right? These guys are going to show up, uh, and they're going to be there. They're going to be much uh, more engaged but you're going to have to train them differently. And again, data focus, because you're only gonna have a short time span to get to them. They are much less focused even than the millennials. And many of you may be thinking, how is that even possible? But they are. Um, we're thinking you know, about eight seconds here, eight seconds to get a point across to them. They are multitaskers, so we're going to have to be dynamic in the, uh, in the training. We're going to have to use different types of uh, interventions uh, for them, not just lecture, not just um, skills, but video. This group is big on digital, right? So they will pay attention to short video vignettes, things like that. Um, they are very, very um, diverse uh, in their group as well. Feedback is going to be important for them. So being able to use something like those visualizations, for example, right, that I showed you, being able to show them something, giving them feedback on how well they're doing, communicating why we're here, what is the point of this training, here's why we're doing it, and showing them the evidence uh, that they need to learn. So experience uh, for this group is really going to be in the social media arena. So as much as you can do through social media and training, I know that sounds crazy, but that is really where we're going to need to engage with them. So this group, too, will also have the two-way dialogue. Now, that's the difference that we're going to see in them from the millennials. They want to be on the Snapchat and all those sorts of things, but they'll also talk to you because they want to be engaged. They want to understand why. They are more focused on the mission 
than the millennials have been uh, historically. And so the mission is important. They are a little different, as I said, they don't have the attention span as the, uh, the millennials have, but they um, will use a lot of the social media, whether Snapchat, Instagram, YouTube, a lot of YouTube. In fact, they've been called the YouTube generation. So video is a big, big deal. They do respond to a lot of visual tactics. That's why, again, the visualizations that I just showed you with the data, emojis. This is the group that brought about emojis, right? And it's probably where um, a lot of your, your kids have taught you to use emojis. Short videos, infographics. And we think about an infographic, what is that? It's just an emoji with words, right? So thinking about how to train this group uh, using data, using video, um, meeting them where they live, and trying to translate what we need to train as fire service instructors into this arena. So teaching them to drive, for example, uh, large equipment is going to be a challenge. Donning their SCBAs, they'll learn it better if you do a video of it, right? So these are the kinds of things that I want you to begin to think about. How do we change the strategy? This group, um, they are intuitive. They're thinkers. They are very active imagination, uh, very excited. They're creative. They'll help you think of new things um, to do. They are also, um, uh, their teaching methods, as I said to you, are going to be very, very different than some of the others of the past. So remember, video is your new friend. Uh, video, data, visualizations, uh, infographics. Things like that is your new friend uh, with this group. So think about starting to translate what we do in the fire service into that type uh, arena for sharing with these new generations. So as we uh, start to, to close down and give you some time to ask some questions, I do want to tell you about our um, INFORS exposure tracker because this really was based on that generation I just showed you getting them from the time they come in the door to track their exposures for purposes of cancer, for purposes of behavioral health, but not just them. We built the app because we know that's where we're going to get them to engage, but this is for everybody. Whether you are in the field, you're retired, you're an instructor, whatever it may be, you should download this app, it's free, it's in the app stores now, and start your career diary. This uh, can be used whether your department is connected with INFOR's uh, analytics that I showed you earlier or not. Um, you will just have to enter incidents or enter dates of training, things like that, uh, for your exposures. But the questions here were written by NIOSH, and the behavioral health module is included as well. So this app is available and is part of that whole data uh, cadre that we mentioned. Another thing that I will tell you in closing is that the IPSDI has been selected to build the new National Firefighter Registry. If you all remember, the Firefighter Cancer Registry Bill was passed last year, and NIOSH um, is, has been mandated to build it, and they are the builders of the, uh, the registry, but the new Data Institute has been contracted to assist. So that exposure app that I just showed you is going to be instrumental in making sure we are onboarding people, all firefighters, active, retired, everybody into this firefighter registry because this becomes our surveillance database going forward for tracking firefighter cancer. So we do want all firefighters um, to be part of this. So this is more of just a, uh, a little bit of information for you so you can help start to spread the word. We anticipate a go live date of next August, so one year from now, as we build this, uh, this new registry, um, that this data is going to help us learn more about firefighter cancer going forward. So with that, I do want to thank you very much uh, for your attention this afternoon. I hope you've gotten some great insights. So I will turn it uh, back over to Jamie. And Jamie, do you have some questions for me? Yes, thank you. Um, let's see, give me one second. Thank you, Lori. Um, if anybody has any questions, please let's add them um, into the chat box and we will address those as they come through. 
<clears throat> I do have two questions already. Um, one is training exposure data included in the exposure app. Okay, that's a great question. So um, if training events are in your CAD um, and you are connected to the Enforce Analytics, then those training events for live fire training, obviously, uh, exposure, they are going to show up and you will be able to document those uh, right in your exposure app. If your department is not connected and you're using the app, then you will need to indicate the address of the training center or whether it was live training, indicate the address and note that it was training and you can add that. So it is important as instructors, a lot of you I'm sure are having exposures just like states in the field and sometimes maybe more. Um, so make sure that you are documenting your exposures right in that exposure app as well. So that, you know, heaven forbid you get cancer um, even after retirement you are going to need evidence of those exposures. And one thing, uh, Jamie, I will tell everybody is a lot of people, um, you all know we have presumptive laws in almost every state in the US. What a lot of people don't know about those presumptive laws is that they presume that you know, this certain type of exposure causes this kind of cancer. What they don't presume is that you as an individual had that exposure. So often in fact in most cases you have to bring evidence to show that you actually were exposed um, to that type of soot or those carcinogens or that that PFAS um, you know whatever it might be the foam we know now know has uh, carcinogens in it so it's important that as instructors that you are logging your exposures as well Lori there's a there's another one um, is there a cost for the N4 system um, there is for the analytics piece. As I said, the exposure app is free. So for the Enforce um, analytics portion, <clears throat> I'm just going to escape out of the slides again if everybody's still on their um, screens and just give you a quick, it's easier for me to show you, I think, so you know where to go. If you go into uh, Enforce.org or IPSDI.org, you'll be able to see, and right here um, is the cost. So there is a one-time uh, integration cost where we build that uh, data exchange pathway with your CAD or your RMS system, and then we build those dashboards for you. And then there's a subscription. It's a lot like PulsePoint, if you're familiar with that, uh, where it is a subscription based on your population. So for example, it's um, only 8,000 a year for the smallest department. And as I said, we're a, we are a nonprofit and we are, um, funded by grants from Homeland Security. So this just uh, helps us to pay for the storing your data on the Amazon web server. So all the data from the department is stored in the cloud. It is secure and all of our security on all of our data um, is to the Department of Defense um, security level. So that's the, the cost and it can be found right on the website. Um, are you aware of any movement toward changing the hour requirements via ISO or National Registry to competency requirements? I am not of any movement, uh, aware of any movement to do that. No, I'm sorry. Um, there was just an additional uh, comment with that that said he's curious because I think these requirements hamstring an agency to be more creative with using time. I'm sorry, Jimmy, can you just repeat that last one? Oh, it was just um, an, an additional comment to the one question about um, changing the hour requirements. He just said he's curious because he thinks that those requirements hamstring an art an agency to be more creative with using their time. Um, someone asks, what about volunteer or combinations departments who do not have the same crews responding? <clears throat> That's a great question. Sorry, I have a tickle in my throat, I apologize. Um, that's a great question. So 
Um, if you show up on the same scene and you are noted in the CAD as a automatic aid or mutual aid system, then we're going to be capturing that data as well. So if you're on the same CAD, if you're not on the same CAD, then the data would not be there. So it would show up just from the uh, originating department. Uh, we would have to talk through that with both departments and both response agencies, but we do have lots of departments that are in that circumstance, and we do see the mutual and the automatic aid data right in their dashboard. Let's see. I don't see any more questions coming in. If anybody has any last minute questions, be sure to put them in the chat box and we'll address them for you. Well, it doesn't look like we've got anything else coming in, but while we're waiting, give it a few more minutes. I uh, just want to say thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, and if you've got a suggestion for a future webinar or if you would like to present one yourself or if you know um, of someone that we should reach out to to host one, send us an email. You can send it directly to my email address that's up on the screen, jamie.lorello at isfsi.org. Um, we also have a spot on our website as well that you can submit presentate our um, proposals and where you can view the recordings of the past webinars. And Lori, was your contact information on a previous slide? Do you want to give that out yes, to the attendees? Yes. Absolutely. It's, uh, it should be on your screen right now. Um, I would love to hear from you. And I really do appreciate the opportunity to spend some time with you all this afternoon. And if you've got any like resources, that, because we'll post the webinar on the website, if you've got any resources that can go with the, with the um, recording on the site, we can host that as well. So people have access to it if they need it. Absolutely. I'll be happy to send some things over. Perfect. All right. Well, it doesn't look like we got any more questions in, so I guess we can go ahead and wrap up, and we'll chat again soon. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Everybody have a great day.